Um, so the first question I'm going to ask you is, uh, what is a mud flat? Um, and so there's kind of like the simple answers. Um, I'm going to, well, actually, let's see. Um, does anybody want to give like one or two words of what they think a mud flat is or like attributes of a mud flat? It could be a guess. Like, I feel like there's some, you know, it's, it's probably flat. Right. And <laughs> like, you can't be wrong. So here, like, I'll give you a guess, a small coastal tidal platform without any vegetation. It's a very good one. Yeah. I'll just go with Emily's and not make you participate too much. Thank you, Emily. Um, so small coastal. Yeah. So I think you hit a lot of the main points. I think the main three that I wanted to put so coastal adjacent to the coast, um, muddy, so there are sand flats, but today I'm going to be talking about mud flats because I think mud is way cooler than sand. Uh, but there's a lot of other dynamics that happen on sand flats that I'd be also willing to talk about. And then uh, the large consensus is that mud flats are intertidal. So that means they're exposed at some point during the tidal cycle. Um, I personally don't believe that. So there are subtidal mud flats as well. So um, some of what I talk about will include the subtitle portion. Oh, I skipped forward. Well, that's fine. No, I think we can. So here are some pictures of, of mud flats. Um, so some of them are really extensive. You, oh yeah, one thing Emily said that was kind of important is they're unvegetated. So you see them kind of, here's two pictures of them in front of a salt marsh at low tide. Um, and they tend to be more extensive in areas that have um, larger tidal ranges. But, um, and then, so these two are from the United States, the two picture, oh, I'm pointing on my screen. Um, the two uh, with marshes are from the United States. The other two are photos from the UK and they have extremely extensive tidal fronts. You can't even really see the edge, you know, the edge of the marsh or anything. And so um, one thing is that like, a lot of people think they look like wastelands or that there's not much there, which is I think why they're ignored often in discussions of coastal systems and coastal transects is, you know, they look pretty barren um, and pretty flat and really quite uninteresting to most people. But there's actually a ton of life that exists there. So, you know, there's a lot of infauna, algae, we're gonna talk a lot about algae today. And, um, you know, really there's a, lot, there's a lot of nutrient cycling going on here as well. And they're extremely important for the physical dynamics of the coast. Um, you'll notice in some of these pictures, especially with the more extensive tidal flats, like the one in the upper right hand corner, um, you'll see that there's drainage networks forming. So just kind of like how you get drainage networks in marshes, you get the same type of thing happening in mud flats. As that, um, as the tide goes out, all of the, the water tends to funnel towards um, a channel network over time. And um, that, that creates your nice, your nice network. A lot of the sediments in these areas are often reworked because they are relatively shallow. So you have waves and currents and we will talk a little bit more about that. But so there's a lot of erosion and deposition happening. Um, do you think, does anyone think, what do you think the oxygen dynamics look like in the sediments here? Is, the, is there oxygen in the sediments? Shake your head, yes or no? No, yeah, so um, kind of like salt marshes, um, you know, there's only the oxic layer is the very surface, kind of where you have like potentially roots or, you know, just where the, the oxygen molecules can get through the sediment because it's mostly muddy, there's very little pore space and um, you get anoxic extremely quickly um, which then it really depends on the little critters that live there to oxygenate the soil. Um, they also tend to smell a lot more like sulfur or methane uh, because they're using those reaction chains and such. And I think you guys talked about like the, the different levels or, you know, oxygen, nitrogen, you guys know what I'm talking about, like the, the rate of the list of reaction ones. Um, I don't know if Matt wants you to know, but like um, how I always remember them is, oh no, my feet stink like methane. Um, so oxygen is O, <laughs> no is like uh, nitrogen, my uh, is manganese, feet, iron, Fe, stink, sulfur, and then methane is 
metamgenesis. But uh, that, that's how I've always remembered that little, so that's a little trick. Anyway, that's slightly off topic. Um, and then another thing you'll notice in these mudflats is there's very like hummock and hollow terrain. You see like kind of really waviness. And so some of that is if there's enough sand in the bed, you might be able to get sand ripples, but often with mud, you can't really get those. But another cause for that is actually biological. So you get some sediment, sediment stabilization from algae, or I'm going to call them algae biofilms or microphytobenthos, and we'll talk about them more later. But basically, when they colonize, you end up with this hummock hollow topography, and it's basically like an alternate stable state. Has Matt talked about alternate stable states yet in class? I think it's going to be later in the semester, but basically the idea of alternate stable states, it's a pretty like big ecological concept is that like things are, it's like either the, the marsh is hot, you have a high marsh or like a low mud flat. There's not really in between elevations, right? You have like two options or like you have very high dunes or very low dunes, but no dunes in the middle. Um, so basically there's like an unstable everything is unstable in like the intermediate between the two states. Um, and it's sometimes very hard to switch in between. The big example he'll probably give later is lakes subject to eutrophication. Um, they're not algae dominated, all the fish are happy. And then all of a sudden it switches to a very algae covered lake. Um, and it's very hard for it to switch back to like the original state. Uh, but anyway, so the, the holic and homo, hummock terrain uh, on mudflats is, is a similar concept of once it gets colonized by algae, that area becomes very stable. So then when the drainage network wants to form, it can't erode into the place where the algae is. So then the drainage network kind of moves over into a place that doesn't have algae. And so then it starts carving out an area. So then the algae don't live there. So then it carves out more and you can kind of see how that creates a feedback where you, where you get a drainage network and you get that up and down topography. Um, so, and then mudflats are made of mud. We talked about it. Have you, you guys talked about cohesive sediments or non-cohesive sediments? No. Okay. Uh, so mud is really sticky. <laughs> I'm sure you guys have all been, you know, you've, you've seen mud in your life. Um, but basically mud behaves as a cohesive sediment and the ionic charges between the particles allow it to stick together and make erosion more difficult, um, as opposed to, to sand. And so I think you guys have, oh, I skipped a slide. Anyway, well, I'll come back to that. Well, I'll actually just skip to that. Um, have you guys seen this diagram in class? I thought he had talked about it. So on the X axis, you have your grain sizes and on your Y axis, you have velocity of some sort. This is the Hillstrom diagram. And then you have two lines, basically a, a settling velocity and then a, a critical erosion velocity. Um, so kind of looking at where mud flats fall, um, take a second to think about, so let's say our, where would you put mud flats in the, on the X axis? Anybody? Are they made of gravel? No. Be like between the 0.01, 0.1, like the clay silt boundary. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, depending on your mud flat, you may have more clay or silt components. Um, I don't know what the Chesapeake Bay is like. I know in Louisiana it tends to be more silt based, so that's kind of what I'm what I'm going from. Um, but uh, so you're in that silt component, um, meaning that so here is kind of I have it kind of right between silt and clay. So if you put mud flats on there, basically you'd see um, that it's hard for sediments to deposit, right? Like that line doesn't run through the blue area at all on the curve uh, because the particles are so small that they stay in suspension with basically any amount of energy, right? Um, some people might consider that like wash load. Um, and then, you know, as you get up to, you know, there's that big yellow so that the particles are easily transported once they're in the water column. However, you can see that the critical threshold of erosion is higher than that of sand. And that's because of the, that cohesive force. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, this is my favorite diagram of like all time. So, uh, <laughs> um, but 
one, so you might say, well, then how are particles even deposited on a mud flat? Like if, if there's not, if they're not able to be deposited based on that line I drew, like, shouldn't we not have mud flats? Um, one of the major processes that occurs is flocculation. So basically the little mud particles in the water bump against each other and they have their ionic charges and they can flock together. And that's actually aided by organic matter that's in the water column as well. And so they form little flocks, which makes the particles bigger and depending how they're packaged, it can increase the settling velocity and allow them to deposit. So that is one way that you can get mudflats depositing, even if this, the grain size is too small. That makes sense? Please stop me if it doesn't make sense. I know, Amy, you're more on like the biological side and there is a biology section of this. I actually didn't realize how much I like physics until I was putting this together. So, um, yeah, so just let me know if I need to repeat something, please. Um, so we're, we're good with the Hillstrom diagram because we're gonna come back to it later when we start talking about the biological component. Okay, cool. So I'm just gonna, because I jumped ahead on this, I'm gonna go back to this and kind of what is a mud flat and kind of giving you the context compared to the marsh. Um, so you see your, your very long transect here um, going from upland forest all the way to, mar uh, to mud flat. And so it's basically, I mean, yeah, you get to, to the open water. And a lot of people might even consider it open water or not even part of the coastal system. Uh, so uh, for example, most transect models that you work on looking at coastal dynamics are, they use very basic formulations of how the mud flats work um, and don't really pay much attention to them. Whereas like, you know, the, the marsh has like very well developed theoretical models, conceptual models, and numerical models to understand how they accrete vertically. But we, we just don't have that for mud flats. So going forward. So what physical processes drive mud flat dynamics? Uh, so we're gonna go through the physics and then we're gonna go through the bi biology. Um, so the physics, basically you have currents and waves, right? Those are like the two main physical forces I mean, storms are basically amplified version of these, but uh, we're going to start with these two. For today, we're just going to assume that currents are very small, so we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about them. Um, because mudflats are generally like pretty shallow, there's not that much water coming on and off of them, so the currents can't get that high, um, if that makes sense. So as like the tide goes out, like that's when the maximum currents to in or out. That's when the maximum currents would be happening because all that water needs to leave the mud flat. Um, but so as it does that, that's when you do you get the highest stresses on the bed. But um, really, you know, if you only have a foot of water on top, there's only so much force that that can create on the bed. And you really shouldn't use English units when talking about this. But anyway, uh, so you have a meter of, or 20 centimeters of, of water over the bed. And so the main driving force that shapes mudflat dynamics are waves. And waves, you know, I'm going to kind of go over briefly the main things that drive shallow water wind waves. And so this is a type of gravity wave, and I'm not going to go too much into like the, the physics. So I'm going to explain more of like the conceptual ideas, if that's okay with you guys. Yeah. Um, so in terms of wind waves, there's three main things that are components of, of, of that to drive how big the waves are. The fetch, the wind speed and duration, and the water depth. So fetch just means the amount of space that the wind has to blow over it. So I have a little cartoon here on here that shows Basically, the wind is blowing from left to right on your screen, and you can see the waves get bigger towards the right. And it's it makes sense, right? If you like blow on a cup of soup, like the way the little ripples will get bigger farther away from you because it needs time to develop those waves. Um, basically, yeah, just like you know, you, you the the wind is hitting little ripples on the the water surface, and then it amplifies those ripples as it catches it catches and drags on the waves. And so then you get fully developed seas. So that fetch is really important. In most mudflat and marsh systems, you're dealing with a fetch limited um, area. Basically, that means that the waves are limited by how big the bay is in front of them. Uh, because, you know, as you guys 
no mudflats and marshes kind of grow in somewhat sheltered like lagoons or back barriers because they need kind of quiescent conditions. So you're not going to have a, a marsh or a mudflat facing like the open ocean, really. <laughs> um, so, you know, you're always limited by that size. So normally that is a, a big factor. Another obvious one is wind speed and duration. Um, basically just gonna focus on wind speed here, but you can imagine that if the wind is bigger, your waves will be bigger. I don't think that that's, that's too complicated. And um, so that's pretty straightforward. And then there's also the water depth. And the water depth basically affects how, how the wave propagates. So if you look down at that bottom cartoon, as a wave passes, it goes in a little circular motion. Um, so it's called orbitals, right? So like a particle of water will actually like start at the crest of the wave and as the wave starts moving, it'll go down and then back up and it's gonna keep going in this circular pattern and it's gonna just move towards the shoreline in that way. All right, does that kind of make sense? Yes. Um, and so in deep water waves, basically that circle that, you know, the energy of the wave gets lower and lower as you go down in water depth and it remains a circle orbital. So you kind of see in that first panel, there's circles that get smaller with depth, but they stay circles. However, when you're dealing with shallow water waves, which is what we're gonna be dealing with today, um, and, and basically the, how you distinguish between deep and shallow water waves is the ratio of the wave length to the water depth, but we're not gonna focus on that. But anyway, so we're gonna be dealing with shallow water waves. And basically what happens is as those orbitals happen, they start kind of feeling the pressure from the ground or like not really the pressure, but they feel the bottom. And so it pushes those orbitals into more oval shapes, right? And so that the actual velocities are not constant around the orbital and you're actually putting more energy on that, the top and bottom of the orbital. So when you hit the bottom, you know, as that piece comes towards the bottom, that piece of water, it's applying a stress to the bed, which can cause the mud flat to change shape and erode sediment. Does that make sense? Yes, okay, good. All right. So the, the, those orbitals are really important for how our waves develop and basically it needs to be able to feel the bottom to do any sort of morphological changes. As a rule of thumb, um, the, the waves feel the bottom when the depth is one half of the wavelength of the waves, uh, but that's not super important. But how I like to think of it is sometimes like when you're swimming, if you're swimming in water and you dive down, you'll, you won't feel the waves anymore. And you can kind of imagine that like the energy of those orbitals are getting smaller and smaller until you dive far enough down to not, to not feel them anymore. So, so yeah, we're dealing with the shallow water in case I forgot to mention that. So I'm gonna go over kind of some, some more of these processes um, based on a paper from Sergio Fargarazzi in 2006. So this is kind of, I decided not to assign you guys any reading because I never like to do the reading before classes. So uh, we're just gonna talk about some of my favorite figures. Um, and so this is basically, um, Sergio developed a model that would uh, do mudflat dynamics and basically showing how it depend mudflat elevation can depend on the depth of the water and the fetch, all right? So for example, so I'm gonna start with the left panel, panel A. So your x-axis is water depth. So this is all below, below water, all right? And the y-axis is shear stress. And then you see that curve, right? And that's the shear stress on the bed from the waves and currents. He did include currents in the model. And so you can see below that curve, um, well, so then you have the horizontal dash line, which is tau critical. You see the tau critical dash line. That means that's the critical shear stress for erosion. Have you guys used that term before, tau? No, okay. That shear, that tau symbol is used a lot of places. Um, so sorry if I, slip into uses, but that's the critical shear stress for erosion. So basically that means you need that big of currents or waves to be able to erode anything on the bed. Okay. 
And then the horizontal line that's depo deposition. This is basically from the Hillstrom diagram that you that at that stress level, things can start to deposit. And the big takeaway here was that when you solve these equations, you can get a stable equilibrium of how deep mud flats should be. So this is kind of getting to that same uh, alternate stable state thing, but I'll, I'll kind of walk you through this. So you see this black point on the bottom that's at like 1.75 meters of depth. Do you guys see the black circle? Okay, so that's basically saying that mud flats are stable at that depth. And what I mean by that is if you have, let's, let's say you deepen your mud flats a little bit. So now they're two meters in depth. They're deeper, so they don't feel the waves as much because you're in deeper water. So not as much erosion happens and more deposition happens. So and then as more deposition happens, it becomes shallower and comes back to that black point, right? Does that make sense? So it's stable, so there's gonna be feedback. So anything to the right of that black point, the, the waves won't be strong enough to erode the bed, you'll get deposition and you'll end up with a depth of 1.75 meters. You with me so far? On the other hand, so if you are at like one meter depth, for example, the waves are so strong. You can see that's where the peak is in um, shear stress. That's in the peak in that in that curve. Basically, at that point, um, there the there's so much shear stress. You're able to erode a ton, and it's going to erode and erode and erode until the waves aren't feeling the bottom as much, and you're going to get to a depth of 1.75 meters. So that's why it's considered a stable equilibrium. Now, if you go to like, for example, so you'll see there's a open circle at 0.5 meters. Yes, you see that? So there's a second numerical solution to this, um, but ba so basically the waves get, you know, bigger with depth, but at, when they're very shallow, it's easy to erode the bottom. And so basically that, that point is mathematically possible to get an equilibrium, but it will actually just keep depositing until you see it kind of, there's the arrow pointing left till you get to depth of zero. And so basically it's saying it'll keep going until it becomes subaerial or basically a marsh. <laughs> so basically what this ended up in, in follow-up papers from Sergio is that you basically either get a mud flat of a certain depth or you get a marsh. And those are your two stable states and everything exists at those two depths like marsh and mud flat. And for a given site, the actual depth may vary um, because this is based on like a certain wind parameter, certain, certain wave periods and stuff like that. But basically, if you look at any system, there's like one depth of mud flats and one height of marsh, give or take. I know you guys have probably talked a lot about marsh elevation. And, you know, there are variations, but like as a whole, it's relatively, it, marshes are relatively flat as are, as are mud flats. So you can see how you know water depth really drives mud flat dynamics. Now looking on the other panel, this one's a little easier. Basically, you see that same curve from panel A, but the curves are different for each fetch. So basically, you know, you have only 500 meters of water in front of your your mud flat or 2,000 meters, and you can see how that curve changes. And basically, if you have longer fetches, you have higher stresses. Does that make sense? That's pretty straightforward. And so that's what this model was able to tell. And this went into like most of the development of how we understand physics of mudflats. Does that all make sense? Cool. I think the big takeaway is that mudflats are at a stable equilibrium based on the stresses from waves and currents. If you wanted to have a sound bite take home message. So Kendall, for the figure A, when you're talking about how this relates to whole shrimp. So then is this based off of a specific grain size? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, he used, I think, a silt size particle. I think he used silt size particles. Um, so yeah, th this is very simplified. So like for a given field site, you would certainly have to take into account what the grain size was. And also, as you guys are aware, like. A, a natural system normally doesn't have just one grain size. <laughs> and so, um, you know, this, this is like the theoretical solutions 
Um, that's why it's like really interesting to me to talk about like that, that unstable equilibrium point because it's like, oh, it's mathematically possible that you'll have really shallow mudflats, but that's just like not realistic. And so I think it's interesting to make sure when you're doing modeling and doing like, like the mathematical component to take into account of like what you actually see in nature because that, that's kind of where those two don't, don't speak well to each other. Cool. So everyone good with the physics so far? Yeah, cool. So now we're gonna talk about the biological processes. So since this is an eco-geomorphic class, um, I'm gonna focus mainly on biofilms. There's a lot of crabs and other in fauna that do a lot of important things on mudflat. I am not as knowledgeable about those. So I'm just not going to really talk about them. Um, but it's always a good thought experiment. And towards the end, we're gonna do a little activity that um, if we wanna talk about those, we can. But um, basically, these little guys are called microphytobenthos or biofilms, pond scum, et cetera. Uh, and they are uh, my favorite biological thing in the world. Um, and on the field trip, I, I definitely pointed some out um, when I went with you guys to the lighthouse field trip, because um, I just think they're really awesome. I'm going to show you field pictures in a second. But basically, they're the majority of the ones we'll be talking about, the ones that form on mud, are made of diatoms, which are this little, this is a, a cell of a diatom. Um, this is a pennate diatom that lives on the bed. And they, um, there can be many different types of diatoms and the biofilm itself is a collection of different diatoms and their secretions. And the secretions make them really sticky. And so they strengthen the sediment. Um, so that, that's what kind of causes the ecogeomorphic reaction. So they actually can change the strength of the sediment. So, you know, we talked about the Hillstrom curve before. Well, this would basically make it harder to erode and we'll kind of come back to that. But um, they are the main autochthonous carbon that occurs on mudflats. So we, you know, Emily mentioned earlier that mudflats are unvegetated, uh, but they do have some photosynthesizers on them, which is cool. And so then you can see in the, the electron scanning microscope photo, um, some, some pictures of the diatom cells. And then you see like kind of like webbing, like if you were, it like almost seems like Spider-Man or something, but the webbing is actually their secretions that they make. And so diatoms are photosynthetic, but they only like a certain amount of light and a certain amount of, of water. So depending on the tide and the light, they actually move vertically through the sediment and they secrete like, <laughs> My favorite, one of my favorite papers is, um, it's called The Secret Garden and it's about microphytobenthos, but um, they secrete basically like little elevators of EPS or extracellular polymeric substances. Um, and they use that to climb up and down in the sediment to go up and down with the tidal cycles and the, and the solar cycle, which is really awesome. And so that EPS is typically what is the sticky part. It's not the actual diatom cells that are sticky, but it's, it's that the secretions. And so what this looks like in the field, there are some beautiful pictures. Um, I think they're beautiful. I know my husband like thinks they're the most disgusting thing he's ever looked at, but um, <laughs> like, so you can see the two on the left um, that you see that kind of brownish color, those are the biofilms. And then um, in Europe, they get really well-developed mats of the cyanob of the, um, the diatom, so that's panel B. You can kind of see like they scraped away the surface and so that really dark brown is actually all diatoms. And then they kind of scraped away in the middle for you to see kind of how much the growth is there. You also can get other types of mats. I'm not really gonna talk about cyanobacteria, but they, they grow biofilms similar to this, but they grow mostly on sandy sediments. But ultimately what these do is you can kind of see that they, with all those secretions, it stabilizes the sediment and increases that critical threshold of erosion or that, that tau critical that I was talking about. Like basically you need bigger waves to erode the bed here. Um, I spent like years of my life growing biofilms in the field, in the lab. And so they're on the right-hand side, I put some pictures of what they can look like in the lab because you can get a little bit better pictures and they're, they're lovely, wonderful grossness. Um, and so basically that bottom panel, you can see how thick that is. And so that was, I, you know, I just put, I put a few cells on the sediment surface and then from them migrating up and down, they created that much like organic 
junk in the top centimeter or so. And when I subjected those biofilms to basically the equivalent of a hurricane stress on the bed, they did not erode. So <laughs> these things can be very, very strong and very, very important for coastal dynamics. And there's a lot of research that's been done on these. So I think on the last slide, if you're interested, the Deitro 2000 paper is a really great review of everything up to the year 2000, um, which basically was a lot of observational studies. Um, these things are really kind of difficult to do in the lab or the field. Um, but now with more advanced technologies, there's there's been a lot of changes in the field as well. So they're, they're really cool and they're really small, which I think is awesome because I think, you know, in in the marsh, everyone talks about plants and how strong they are and how they, you know, the roots provide stability and they're just so visual. Most people would ignore these guys on the mud flat if you were out there and you wouldn't think they are very important, but they actually, they play a very similar role as the plants do in salt marshes. You actually do see biofilms in salt marshes underneath the plants, so they provide some stability. And also, if you have a dieback area within a marsh, often these biofilms will go there before plants grow um, and provide initial stabilization before you get the vascular plants. So, um, so they are also very important for coastal restoration things. We good with the that so far? A friend of mine made this figure and it's really good, but it's like really busy. So I wanted to include it, <laughs> but uh, I, it's a lot, uh, but it's a kind of good um, summary of everything that biofilms do. So they can change the critical shear stress. We've talked a little bit about that. Basically it makes the sediment stronger. They can change the erodibility parameter. So basically the, the rate of erosion of the mud beneath that layer, um, that's normally a big modeling parameter. So. Um, a lot of current work is trying to get biofilms into models. They can change the settling velocity. I think I said before, you know, we talked about those flocks coming together to allow deposition on the mud flats. Well, all that organic matter that's around in the water column from biofilms can increase the settling velocity. They could also change the bed friction, which changes erosion rates as well. So you can imagine you know, when you have a sandy bed, as the water flows over the sand, there's like a lot of little bumps, right? So there's more friction. But if you have a very smooth biofilm, you may not have, have as much friction. Um, so it can change the, the physical dynamics at the boundary. Um, so this yeah, big summary diagram basically showing, so starting kind of, we're gonna focus on that bio sediment system box in the middle. So if you have, you know, initial colonization of biofilm, you know, at first when they're starting to grow, um, you don't really have as much stabilization, but once they've grown enough, their EPS has been incorporated in the sediment, that sticky stuff, and it coats the surface layer of the sediment and makes it really hard to erode. And then over time, that EPS kind of seeps down in the sediment as they migrate ver vertically more and more and more, creating more and more cohesion and it's stabilizing further and further down. So basically, they're really awesome, even though they're really tiny. Any questions on this? I get really excited about biofilms um, as you, I probably started talking faster. So if, if you have questions, um, please stop me. But I, I it's just, um, I think they're really cool. Well, and they're found, hmm? I was just gonna say, do they ever stop growing? Like when do they? run out of room. <laughs> yeah, so they do have kind of the carrying capacity of the surface of the mudflat, but normally they don't reach that because they also are a good basal food source for our food webs. So lots of snails and crabs and other, other critters like to eat them. So normally there's enough disturbance that they don't reach their maximum carrying capacity. The other thing is eventually the EPS will decompose. So, you know, depending if it, um, depending on if there's oxygen to do the reaction or, you know, the, all the different conditions to be able to, to get the decomposition. So, but normally you don't get it so packed with EPS that it's at like a maximum, um, yeah, because the, the grazing of the decomp is happening. Sometimes um, like big mats of the biofilm will get like peeled off and then those can be deposited somewhere else and sometimes can, can create a new colony somewhere else. But even when they become peeled off, the underlying sediment normally still has some EPS um, to, to strengthen everything. 
So pretty cool. I, I have a question. The EPS is um, what are they chemically or do they leave a signature in like paleo marshes and stuff like that? I don't know about paleo marshes. So they're so it's normally some carbohydrates is like the main thing we look for, but they're they're considered extremely label labile. So I don't know how long they would persist in the environment. It's actually something I'm working on in the paper I'm working on is how long they stick around. Um, I think it would depend on the burial rate because if you have high sedimentation rates, these guys wouldn't decompose as fast. And so like the EPS wouldn't decompose as fast. So you might be able to bury some of it quite deep. There's a few studies off of the Amazon river. So the mudflats outside of the Amazon river where they have biofilms that were like living there with their EPS. And then there was like a big fluid mud deposit that landed on top of them. And they preserve like the whole layer of biofilm. And then the biofilm, like some of it migrates to the surface and reestablishes re like, you know, the few best cells get up there and start again. And so they actually, they have like tons and tons of layers that indicate when fluid mud like came over and covered the biofilm. And you can see those going back, I want to say hundreds of years, but I'm not sure, but like tons of lamina. So they can be preserved, but I think you need certain conditions to do so. Yeah, I think the big thing is in marshes to prove that it's biofilms <laughs> and not like um, exudates from plants and other things um, that I'll, people, plant people like to say that plants are the only thing contributing to the carbon in, in marshes. So um, a lot of the, the more recent techniques using um, com compound specific stable isotope analysis and things like that are trying to tease out the relative contribution of microphytobenthos, but that's still kind of, I think also using sulfur isotopes is helpful in determining that as well. Oh, and so I'm talking like a lot of small scale because I did a lot of these laboratory manipulations and things like that. Um, but I have a friend who she took the idea of the biofilms, um, increasing the critical shear stress and doing all the, the, the wonderful strengthening we talked about. And she applied this to an entire estuary. Um, so this, this is, I think, the Ems estuary in Europe somewhere. Um, and so this is modeling. So, you know, the panel on the left is the bed elevation. The middle panel is the percent mud and in reference to without biofilms. So like, you know, um, brown would be, is it, well, so zero means it's the same amount of mud as without biofilms. And then on the right panel, it's the bed level compared to without biofilms. So zero would mean the same as with biofilms. That makes sense? And so basically you can see that with biofilms, there was more mud retained in the estuary um, and the bed level increased and it actually created stronger banks. So um, the, the edges of the estuary were much stronger. So while biofilms are important on the small scale, they actually scale up to having large morphological differences on, on, on an estuary scale, which is pretty awesome. So here's back to our Hillstrom diagram. Um, so yeah, so basically the idea is if you were going to kind of rethink about this in terms of a mud flat with microphytobenthos, you can imagine that the critical shear stress would basically be increased everywhere, right? Um, that you would need more, more energy to erode the bed, right? Does that make sense? So kind of redraw that line. Um, and I drew it this way, but I'm not actually sure that it goes that way. I just kind of drew it up that <laughs> um, that you would need that. Well, like, I think it makes sense that things could deposit at higher stresses because you get higher settling velocities from from some of the packaging of flocks. So then that means if you look oh, if you look at that line we looked at before, kind of in that silt category, like you're getting very different dynamics. Um, where you're getting more settling of particles, but then also not eroding quite as much. Does that make sense? And so how do marshes and mudflats interact? Because this class is mostly about marshes. And so kind of how do, how do we get these, these talking to each other? 
So mud flats, you know, they're in front of the marsh. So I put my happy little marsh plants on the right hand side here. And you have these waves coming in. You can see those orbitals changing and the waves getting steeper and steeper. And basically what's happening is the mud flat creates some bottom friction as compared to the deeper water. And it causes the waves to partially break and also loses some energy. Some of that energy actually goes into the mud. You can kind of imagine like, you know, if you put a in your sink, you have like a sponge on one end and you make little waves, like the, the sponge will kind of absorb some of the energy. The mud works the same way. And so basically it reduces the wave height at the marsh edge, which reduces erosion and it, re and it reduces like the overall energy of the system. So they're really important for how, how marshes survive. Um, they actually, you know, take a lot of that energy away from marsh edge erosion. Have you guys talked about marsh edge erosion at all? A little bit, yeah, maybe. But yeah, I mean, basically just waves drive the edge to erode backwards. And so it's pretty important. And then there's also this idea that there's a critical width of mud flat um, that allows, like basically if you get mud flats that are too big, your marsh will die. <laughs> and so this is um, kind of an important feedback. So basically, if you have relative sea level rise or decreased sediment supply, you get deepening of tidal flats. So kind of the top of that, the little my little diagram that I made. So you know, you take away sediment or you increase the sea level, your tidal flat is deeper, right? And if your tidal flat is deeper, you can get bigger waves, right? Like in a puddle, your waves can only be so big. As your puddle gets deeper, you can imagine waves can get bigger. So you have deeper tidal flat, larger waves, which increases the erosion of the marsh edge, right? That makes sense. If there's bigger waves, your marsh edge is going to erode more. If your marsh edge erodes more, it's going to create a larger mud flat, creating a larger fetch, which will make larger waves deepen in and kind of continue this whole system until you get runaway erosion and your marsh will, will just erode away. So you need to have some tidal flats to exist in order to dissipate the wave energy. But if the tidal flats get too big, it drives overall loss of the marsh. Make sense? Okay, so I think, so does anybody have any questions about what I, want, what I talked about? Cool. All right. So I wrote a little toy model for just kind of show you how mudflats evolve. And I, I wanted to try this out and see. So if you guys want to bear with me on this, I promise I will stick to time. Um, so kind of to show you um, who here works in Mat with MATLAB at all. I'm not going to make you code anything, I promise. OK. <laughs> Basically, I wrote a really simple model in MATLAB. So it's like. 75 lines and I think half of it's like the plotting. So this is not like a complicated model. This is just basically how waves and currents drive mud flat evolution. All right, so I'm gonna run the model and it's gonna pop up a video of, of the model running. Um, and it's the time's gonna be, it's gonna show every few hours. So I'm just gonna play it first. This is kind of with the default parameters to kind of show you what it looks like. Hey Kendall, like. Uh, you're still on PowerPoint. I'm still on PowerPoint. Yeah. Oh, so for Zoom, you gotta like stop screen sharing and then share the oh, whole desktop. Really? That's I know. Dumb. That's so dumb. I think there's a way around it, but I've yet to figure it out. Okay. I'm gonna try it this way. I think you then you won't be able to see the code, but can you see the panel? You just see three panels. Is that what you guys see right now? Cool. All right. So. I'll just go over the three panels first. So the top panel is elevation of the mud flat and of the water level. So you can see like the red line is the, the tides going up and down. And then see, and your blue line is your mud flat. The X axis is just distance and the ocean is on your right hand side and your marsh is on your left hand side, okay? The second panel is just energy and the blue is from currents and the red is from waves. And you can kind of see it change over time. And then the bottom panel is wave height. And you can see that the wave height is bigger towards the ocean. And then as it starts feeling the bottom, that friction and energy dissipation happens and the waves get smaller as they cross the mud flat. So does that make sense so far? So um, how many, I have it running for 5,000 hours. Um, so 
you can see like, um, let's watch. So as the tide goes up, you see that the currents, the blue line on the second panel go up. And then as the, you know, so that's basically that water coming on and off the mud flat, right? And that's what's happening. And then the waves only really occur on the right-hand side from the open ocean and they get dissipated rather quickly, right? Does everyone, does it make sense to everyone? I just thought it'd be fun because this is kind of what I do. And so kind of understanding that this is like, like just basically first principle physics to be able to get how, how a, um, a mud flat evolves. So I use kind of a small, um, I use a small wave height. So you can kind of see what your mud flat profile looks like. So that blue line in the top panel. Everyone see that? So now I want to change some mud flat some of the parameters in the model to kind of show you how it would change. So like let's say right now I only have 40 centimeter, oh I put yeah, 40 centimeter waves. Why do we make the waves huge? Does that sound like a fun experiment? Okay. So I'm gonna just I don't know if you what can you see right now? It just paused. Okay, cool. So I'm going to make the waves one meter high and let's see, let me know if it doesn't show you anything. I need to share your screen again. Okay, do you see it now? So now this is with huge waves. So you see the wave height is now one meter. You see the energy from the waves. I kept the y axis on the energy plot the same as before. So you see the energy is much, much larger. And can you see what's happening to our mud flat? So it, this is already like, we watched a few thousand hours before. You can see that the mud flat is already a lot deeper than we had, and it's retreating towards the land a lot faster. That's because that energy is eroding everything much, much quicker. Does that make sense? I just think it's cool. I don't know if anybody else finds this cool, but I, I do. Uh, and so this is kind of how you can use modeling to understand processes. So if um, I'm going to stop share and I'm going to try sharing a different version of the screen. So hopefully this will work. Can you see everything on my screen now? Okay, great. So now I'm going to turn the waves back down to like half a meter, but like, let's say we want to include microphytobenthos in this model. So there is a critical shear stress I put in here. So right now it's very easy to erode everything, but if we say, well, let's make it hard to erode, how will that change everything? And I need to pause the. So now if you look at how the mud flat works with kind of the lower waves, can you see the, the video going like of the, the model? So you can see what's happening is so your mud flat is actually much flatter because even though there's energy from the waves, it's not able to erode the sediment surface because of the strengthening from the biofilm. And so this is kind of how you can use like a simple toy model to understand basic processes and kind of get an idea of how the system works. Whereas like we're not dealing with actual field measurements or, or things like that. Um, yeah, so I think that's where it is 150. So I think I'm gonna leave it there even though I would love to play with this more if you have other ideas or if you wanted to you know, do this I wasn't sure how long I would talk about the beginning stuff. So I was gonna like make you guys come up with, with hypotheses on this, but I'm, I, think, I think we're good for today. Um, but do you guys have any questions for me or? I just wanted to say, I liked your figures and your analogies that helped understand it. <laughs> okay, good, I'm glad. Cause I was most worried, especially for you with like the waves and stuff, just cause it's not your background at all. So I'm glad it was somewhat helpful. Um, I don't know how helpful like the model is for thinking. I like to think in math terms, but I know some other people are like, oh my God, code, I don't want to see it. So um, yeah, but, uh, well, thank you for, for listening along. And um, if you have any questions or thoughts or whatever, I'd love to hear it. And it's been nice talking with you all. <laughs>